So Dave has already started planning next year's wedding anniversary celebration. He's been pawing through the brochures about hiking trips in Banff, boat tours on the Great Lakes, even a train excursion to the north. You, you get a certificate, he said, when, when you cross the Arctic Circle. I beg your pardon, said Morley. <laughs> it's suitable for framing, said Dave. <laughs> Dave and Morley got married in the summer over 20 years ago. And Dave, you might be surprised to learn, has been planning all of their wedding anniversary celebrations for the last few years. Dave loves to mark each passing year, loves to tell everyone about the longevity of his marriage. It makes Dave feel rejuvenated and hopeful. 20 years, over 20 years, and all is still well. It was this notion, this notion that he and Morley have hardly changed, that led Dave to this year's idea. The idea that this summer, he and Morley should spend their anniversary the same way they spent their honeymoon, in a canoe. <laughs> the first canoe trip since their honeymoon. What do you think, said Dave to Morley, as they got ready for bed one night in early June? They had the time. Stephanie would be tree planting. Sam would be at camp. Morley was in her mid-twenties that summer when they were married. They'd gone to Algonquin Park. And she remembered, oh, the call of the loons and the rippling leaves and the two of them lying in their sleeping bags outside their tent, staring up at a sky of crowded stars. That would be perfect, said Morley. On their honeymoon, young and fit, and with time on their hands, they had spent six full days in the park. They settled on three days for their return trip. <laughs> three days and two nights. The wolf of ambition was not as restless as it was when they were young. <laughs> Dave found a route they could do in the few days they had. And one night, late in June, he and Morley descended into the basement to look for their camping stuff. Morley sorted through the camping pots and pans. She checked out the propane stove, inspected the backpacks. She headed to the sporting goods store to fill in the holes that 20 years had made in their camping gear. Dave? Well, Dave was in charge of the tent. Their first day in Algonquin Park was gloriously sunny and warm. Dave and Morley paddled gently along the shoreline, talking about the kids and reconnecting with one another. It took them longer to reach their campsite than Dave had predicted. By the time they dragged the canoe up on shore, the sun was dipping and the sky was dusty and orange. They set up camp. Morley pulled the camping pots from the canoe and Dave headed over to the edge of the clearing to put up the tent. He'd packed the same two-man tent they had used all those years ago. <laughs> Not without checking it out. <laughs> checking it out included pulling the tent from the bag, confirming that there were still poles and pegs, that the fly was there too. Checking it out did not, however, include unfolding the nylon tent <laughs> or fitting the poles together or doing a trial run by putting the tent up in the backyard. If he had done that, Dave would have realized that even that miracle fiber nylon changes over 20 years. <laughs> in the 45 minutes that it took Dave to wrestle their tent up, he had plenty of time to take in the rotting seams, <laughs> the cracked fabric, and the rusty zippers. Crouching inside to unroll the mats and put down the sleeping bags, he watched the last rays of the sun seep through the yawning gaps of their only shelter. <laughs> Supper that night was reconstituted freeze-dried chili. While it was cooking, Dave popped some freeze-dried turkey hash into his mouth. You're supposed to add hot water to that, said Morley. I know, said Dave, who was chewing energetically but you'd be surprised how good it is like this. At the end of the meal, Dave gathered all their food up and put it into an old green canvas backpack, a, a woods tripper, 
And then he tied a rope around the top of the pack and he flung the rope over a high branch of a maple tree some distance from their tent and then he hauled the food up high into the air. There he said, if the bears want a snack, they'll have to do a bit of climbing. Morley fell asleep almost immediately. Dave lay there grateful that she was so exhausted she didn't notice the mosquitoes that were moving in and out of the zipped up tent with impunity. (laughs) And then Dave fell asleep too. Next thing Dave knew, Galway the cat was on his bed. She'd been doing this a lot lately, climbing up there before the alarm and rubbing around the pillow and tickling Dave with her whiskers. Don't get ahead of me. (laughs) Dave knew what she wanted. She wanted Dave to feed her. And he half thought of batting her away. But it was probably time to get up anyway, so Dave said, okay, Galway, and he opened his eyes. (laughs) Now, like many people, Dave has, in idle moments, wondered how he might react if he ever found himself in the thick of a crisis. (laughs) If he was, say, a customer at a bank during a holdup or a hostage in a hostage taking. Largely, he wonders about these things in bed at night. Lies in the darkness, working out the steps he'd take if his parachute was twisted when it opened. Not that he has any plans of jumping out of a plane. But these are important questions, and they're things that occupy Dave's mind when sleep won't. He's considered many things, worked through many scenarios, though never what he would do or should do if he woke up in a tent eyeball to eyeball with a skunk. He said, okay, Galway, and he opened his eyes. And there was a beat of silence and then another. And what he did was he gasped and he sat bolt upright. The skunk scampered to the bottom of his sleeping bag. (laughs) And lifted his tail. (laughs) And stood there with his eyes locked on Dave's. Dave tried to look as friendly as he could. He smiled and nodded. The skunk twitched its tail. Dave froze. Skunk, which was outside of the sleeping bag, was actually standing on Dave's feet, which were inside the bag. Skunk seemed undecided. And the two of them stared at each other for what felt like a long time and actually was a long time given the circumstances. Five minutes passed. And during those five minutes, Dave had only one thought. Don't move your feet. (laughs) Morley was still asleep. Five minutes passed, though it felt much longer than five minutes. And then the skunk, who seemed to have taken Dave's smile as an invitation to stay a while, (laughs) sat down. began to snore. (laughs) Then it got up again and ambled over to Morley's backpack. Bag was lying in the corner of the tent and the zipper was open. And Dave watched as the skunk poked its nose into the pack. And that's when the squirrel leapt out. (laughs) Blur of brown fur catapulted across the tent. And both the skunk and Dave jumped simultaneously. The skunk landed in Dave's lap. (laughs) And Dave screamed, and Morley, who was still asleep, more or less, shouted. And then there was a flurry of flying fur and the sound of nylon ripping, and Morley and Dave burst from the tent, gasping for breath. (laughs) And as they stood there, beside what was left of their tent, Dave glanced at his watch. 10.30. (laughs) Couldn't be. 
Oh my God, he said, hurry up, hurry up. We got to pack up. He said, pack up, pack up. We got to get going or we won't make it to the next campsite before dark. <laughs> 20 minutes later, they were floating along the shoreline again. By 12.30, Morley had gone just about as far as she could go without food. They decided to have a picnic on the water. Now, at just about that time, Nellie and Ken Chapman were getting ready to take a break too. Nellie and Ken were paddling down the same shoreline that Morley and Dave had left behind. And at just about that time, Nellie and Ken spotted the campsite that Dave and Morley had vacated just a few hours earlier. It wasn't the easy access or the small clearing that drew their attention. What caught Nellie and Ken's attention was the large green backpack hanging from the branch of the tree. <laughs> what do you mean you forgot the food, said Morley. <laughs> Weakly. She wasn't as angry as you might imagine. Her right eye was swelling from a mosquito bite and her back ached. Morley felt too beaten up, too weak and too hungry to be angry. We'll go back and get it, said Dave, feathering his paddle in the water. It'll only take a few hours. <laughs> but they couldn't go back and get it. They were supposed to pick Sam up the following afternoon at five. They were two days paddle away from the park entrance, from their car, from a telephone, from any way to reach their son. Morley could imagine the scene in her mind's eye, a, a deserted camp parking lot. Sam standing small and alone, waiting sadly for the parents who had clearly forgotten him. Just paddle, she said, just paddle. As luck would have it, they were not entirely without food. After half an hour of paddling, Morley remembered that she had shoved some snacks into her pack and had forgotten to move them into the food bag the night before. There was a small Swiss chocolate bar, two packs of sugarless gum, and a one-pound bag of red licorice. <laughs> Dave watched in amazement as Morley pulled it from her knapsack. No wonder there was so much activity in their tent. He didn't say that. <laughs> After the licorice stopped, Morley and Dave fell into a rhythm, their strokes steady and even. Across the lake, Dave spotted a young couple paddling. They were the only people they had seen since entering the park. I wonder if they're on their honeymoon, said Dave. <laughs> if they get a little closer, said Morley, I have some advice I'd like to give them. <laughs> By the late afternoon, they'd entered a river. They were supposed to portage past the set of rapids and continue for another mile to that night's campsite. Dave maneuvered over to the left side of the <clears> river. <throat> Where's the portage, said Morley. Should have been right there. Dave was gesturing at the riverbank. It was a stretch of wet marsh, more a bayou than a bank. They could hear the rapids. They were going to have to get out of the river, portage trail or no portage trail. Dave wedged the canoe between two fallen logs as close to dry land as he could. And then he and Morley jumped out into the knee-deep water. They muscled the boat towards the shore. And when they got to higher ground, Dave looked at Morley, who was sitting in the dirt, her back against the side of the canoe. Her hair was tangled and matted and sticking out at odd angles. She was gritty and sweaty, her face sunburned and spotty. What, said Morley. <laughs> I didn't say anything, said Dave. <laughs> they set off down the path with the canoe hoisted over their heads. As they trudged along, the sun began to dip below the trees. Night was settling on the forest path. Dave took the lantern and held it in his teeth. And the two of them lurched along like two soaked donkeys. The, the canoe balanced awkwardly over their head. Morley was up to her ankles in mud, and she was sinking deeper with each step. Pretty soon she was wet up to her thighs, covered in muck and mosquito bites. She could only see out of one eye. Her arms ached and her head hurt. Before long, the mud was sloshing around her knees and Morley was thinking that she was about as uncomfortable as a person could be. 
Unfortunately, she was wrong. <laughs> Minute later, her foot settled deep into the oozing, slippery muck. When she pulled it out, her shoe was missing. <laughs> I don't have to tell those of you who are married that during a marriage, things get sad. <laughs> during a marriage, certain things, things a self-respecting growing up might not admit to, well, let's be honest, certain angry things do get sad. And after 20 years of marriage, 20 years of careers and child rearing, 20 years of homemaking and renovations, 20 years of car trips and school trips, 20 years of birthday parties and Christmas turkeys. <laughs> well, a lot of these certain things get said. In fact, so many of these certain things have been said in Dave and Morley's household that, quite frankly, Dave thought he'd heard about every certain thing that Morley would ever say. <laughs> Unfortunately, he was wrong. He prayed it was just the licorice talking. <laughs> the sun had completely disappeared by the time Morley and Dave stumbled into the clearing at the end of the portage trail. When they got there, the lantern battery gave up. Light dimmed and flickered out. Dave said, I guess this is the end of the road for us. Morley said, you can say that again. <laughs> I meant for tonight, said Dave. <laughs> they settled their canoe into some muddy ground beside the river. Dave put Morley's soggy sleeping bag in the bottom and he crawled in. He had his feet under one seat and was leaning against the other. Morley got into the canoe and sat between Dave's legs. She covered herself with a rubber ground sheet. It started to drizzle. <laughs> Eventually, somehow, who can explain these things? Morley fell asleep. Not long after, she woke up with Dave nudging her. Wake up, he said. Morley opened her eyes, and when she did, the sky was glowing. There were flashing streaks of pale blue and green light filling the sky like sheet lightning. It looked as if someone had draped the horizon with some sort of huge shimmering veil. It was the northern lights. Remember, said Dave, they had seen them on their honeymoon too. Dave and Morley sat in the middle of that canoe in the middle of that night under the most spectacular of light shows, the Aurora Borealis. Dave's arms were around Morley and she felt remarkably warm, cozy even, and comfortable. She moved her head onto her husband's chest. She heard his heart slowing down, beating a gentle, steady rhythm beneath his sweater. A loon called out across the water, and the lights continued to dance. Morley sighed. I guess, said Dave, some things don't change after 20 years. No, said Morley. I, I mean, yes. <laughs> she sounded surprisingly content. I guess they don't, she said. Like I said at the beginning, Dave has started planning next year's anniversary already. <laughs> he hasn't given up on the idea of taking another canoe trip sometime. But next year, he's thinking he'll try something different. He's been looking at a brochure for a place called the Albion Resort. Brochure is pretty slick. It says, the inn where we take care of everything. <laughs> After 20 years of marriage, Dave knows good advice when he reads it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.